You're listening to A Book With Legs, a podcast presented by Smead Capital Management. At Smead Capital Management, we advise investors who fear stock market failure. You can learn more at SmeadCap.com or by calling your financial advisor. Welcome to A Book With Legs podcast. I'm Cole Smead. I'm the president and a portfolio manager here at Smead Capital Management. At our firm, we are readers and book junkies. It can be said that leaders are readers, and we believe books provide us a great source of information for filtering what is and isn't important for us as investors. Investing is the last great liberal art and the best way to spend a lifetime of learning. This podcast is for readers, thinkers, business-minded people, and investors who want to grow their knowledge from great authors and their writing. Charlie Munger often talks about using multiple mental models and analysis. Our aim for this podcast is to help listeners test Munger's theory in business, markets, and people. We're glad everyone has joined us for this episode. We are going to learn about the history of what we all benefit from in the field of cardiology. Thomas Morris is joining us to talk about his book, The Matter of the Heart. Mr. Morris is a freelance writer and his journalism has appeared in publications like The Times in London and The Financial Times. He also worked for the BBC for many years as a successful radio producer with a particular interest, as we'll talk about, in scientific and medical topics. He is also the author of the Dublin Railway Murder, a murder mystery book that he published late last year. Thomas, I'm really glad you could join me today. Um, your book is the story of 11 procedures that you talk through the history and the successes and failures of related to the heart. Um, so I guess my first question is, um, what inspired you to go at, at, at this story and, and why the heart particularly? Well, it's a story I first came across about 20 years ago. Um, just uh, just a kind of a, a, a by chance really I, there, I was watching a documentary that uh, the BBC produced in the late 90s about one of the great heart surgeons of the 20th century a man called Michael DeBakey who was active had, had an incredibly long career in Houston Texas um, he qualified in medicine in the 1920s he was working as a specialist cardiac surgeon uh, by the late 1940s an era when cardiac surgery had barely begun and he carried on working there until the beginning of the of the present century um, when he was by then in his late 90s um, at the age of 99 he was the oldest survivor of an operation he had himself invented half a century earlier um, so mm. I first got in, interested in him because this documentary showed him already in his 90s traveling around the world testing a new technology he had invented, a type of implantable pump that could take over part of the function of the heart in people with very advanced um, heart failure. And uh, his story was really the sort of inspiration for my looking more deeply into what had happened in what turned out to be quite a concentrated period in the middle of the 20th century. You can really talk about the golden age of heart surgery as being around between about 1953 when the first open heart surgeries took place and 1970 which was when the era of the transplants began in the late 1960s um, and it was the most extraordinary period of um, concentrated innovation um, development um, and a, an evolving understanding of what it is really that the heart does and how it makes uh, makes us you know uh, how, how it is part of us uh, and, and I mean that in a sort of almost met metaphysical sense as well as um, a physiological one. The introduction to your book starts out with a study that you quote from uh, from the Royal College of Surgeons of England asking the question are surgeons psychopaths? <laughs> um, I, it's an incredibly funny way to start your your readers out um, can you explain to our audience the study and why you put this in the introduction of the book? Yes, well, I mean, the, the, the reason I put it in, um, and it's a kind of lighthearted um, article, really. Uh, the medical journals occasionally like to have a bit of sort of fluff to entertain their readers, as well as the hard scientific articles. And one of the things that professional medics uh, like to um, discuss and in, in a kind of humorous way is the different types that you see and and if you spend any time in a hospital environment with different surgeons and physicians from different disciplines you'll you'll notice that there are character types um, and so you can always sort of you, th there are all these jokes about about what makes um, orthopedic specialists different from cardiac surgeons from brain surgeons and pediatricians and um, one of the uh, the journal I think of, of the um, 
uh, Royal Society of Medicine sent out a, essentially a questionnaire uh, and they were trying to find out the personality types that go into the different sub-disciplines of medicine. Um, and they found that, psycho that uh, the disciplines that were most likely to have sort of markers for psychopathy uh, were uh, cardiac surgery and actually paediatrics is one, which is kind of a bit counterintuitive. Um, mm -hmm. But actually the reason that, you, that, that this might be uh, possible to explain is that actually if you're going to be a paediatrician, um, you have to, um, you, it's very dangerous really to get attached to your patients. Um, and if you're dealing with a lot of children uh, in your practice and some of the outcomes that you're dealing with are not as, uh, are not as good as you had hoped, uh, you need to sort of, in some way, kind of harden yourself to the possibility of your patient dying, which is more painful if it's a child, um, if you've become sort of attached to them. So <laughs> this survey um, ostensibly uh, found that cardiac surgeons and paediatricians were the most psychopathic people on your hospital ward. I mean, I think having said that, the results should be taken with a pinch of salt. Yeah, when it, and and I found it interesting because um, to your point, that it's the unknown outcomes, and you know we're investors and we deal with an unknown future, which obviously brings unknown outcomes from the outset. So I I, I think a theme we'll we'll probably hit on throughout our discussion today is the parallels. Um, between you know your writing and, and these doctors and the risks they take, um, and and what and similar in our industry we have to see with investors. So another another kind of big picture thing that you you drew out early in your book, um, you know obviously there's a war going on in Ukraine right now. Most people think of wars causing severe economic damage, which they do in in, in many cases. Um, but your book made me really rethink uh, what the aftermath of wars cause. Um, can you can you start by introducing us to Le Leroy Rohrbach and and explain you know what he was um, in, in 1945 uh, for you know kind of progressing what we learned of the heart at that time? Yeah, well, he was um, an, an American um, infantry soldier who um, had been very badly injured during uh, the aftermath of D-Day, the advance of the American forces and uh, the Allied forces into northern France, and. Um, he ended up with a fragment of shrapnel um, trapped in his chest, which um, he was airlifted to a hospital in Gloucestershire. In fact, not far from where I'm sitting now, only about 30 miles away. And in 1944, in the preparations for D-Day, the American military set up a huge field hospital um, in the middle of rural Gloucestershire. This is a place that's really quite remote um, in England. Um, and the idea of this field hospital was that it was going to be there to treat chest injuries. Um, and casualties were airlifted in from northern France and as the Allies advanced from further into the continent as well. And in this specialist field hospital in Gloucestershire, there was a young surgeon by the name of Dwight Harkin. And Dwight Harkin was then 34. He had trained, um, in fact, in London in his 20s, but um, also in the best hospitals in America. And he had made um, a specialist study of um, how to treat patients with chest wounds, but particularly those who, who had ended up with bullet fragments inside the chambers of the heart. And Leroy was a patient who um, was a particularly difficult case in that he'd had two previous operations for this single fragment of, of bullet which had ended up inside the left ventricle of his heart. And so it was third time lucky and Dwight Harkin uh, one, one day in 1945 succeeded in removing this bullet fragment. Now, he wasn't the only patient he did this for. Um, in fact, he had an amazing um, case series of more than 40 patients um, who had bullet fragments removed from part of the heart without a single death. And this result um, was absolutely extraordinary. Although surgeons before then had succeeded in removing fragments of metal from the heart, nobody had ever done it with a 0% mortality rate. Um, and that was really the moment that surgeons around the world looked and realised that it was possible to operate on this organ without killing the patient. And, and that it was something that might uh, one day be a routine part of surgical technique. The readers are also left with the feeling of the relief of the patient, though, because as you pointed out, um, this shrapnel would cause just intense anxiety uh, among the victims of the shrapnel and they could they could feel it effectively pulsating in their heart. Is that fair? Yeah, I mean, w one of the things that's rather interesting about this is that it is actually perfectly possible uh, in some cases to live for quite a long time with um, a, a shrapnel fragment embedded in the heart or even sitting sort of loose inside the cardiac chambers. 
Um, and the surgeons in the, 20, in the, in the Second World War realised um, that there was uh, this phenomenon which was termed cardiac anxiety, um, which was that even if this piece of metal was actually causing you no harm, and, and some of these patients might happily have lived for another 40, 50 years without any problems, um, the, the everyday anxiety of knowing that this foreign body was there in your heart was just overwhelming. It, it could cause this whole sort of spectrum of what we would now recognise as, as mental illnesses. Um, uh, but a, a patient like Leroy Rohrbach, who, who knew that this thing was there, even though he was told it probably wouldn't harm him, he wanted it taken out just because the, just the overwhelming anxiety of knowing this thing was there was too much to bear. Now, blood bags had not been invented yet, as you pointed out in your book. So this was, I mean, in, in, in comparison to what we have today, if we were going into a surgery like this, um, this was crude. W what was used in lieu of the blood bags that we'd see in hospitals today? Yes, I mean, the, pr the conditions were very primitive in lots of ways. These operations were not taking place in a conventional operating room. Uh, they were taking place in a concert hut, which was a, a fabricated um, corrugated iron structure in a field, uh, which had to be heated by a stove in the winter because it was so poorly insulated. And before the invention of blood bags, um, if you needed to give a blood transfusion to your patient, what would happen was that the blood was put in a glass bottle, which was then pressurized with air um, and then a, a rubber tube placed in the vein of the patient. But because it was glass and because it was pressurized, sometimes it would just shatter. And then the whole operating table, the patient and the surgeons would be covered in these fragments of glass, blood. And it was it was just a, a very primitive operation, all told. So to kind of set the stage for another theme, um, you know, beyond the risks we talked about that these surgeons were willing to take, I'm going to quote for, I'll pull a quote from your book. Um, you point out in your book, in 1896, the author of the most widely read British textbook on chest surgery, Stephen Paget, wrote, quote, surgery of the heart has probably reached the limits set by nature to all surgery. Now, uh, uh, no, no new method, no new discovery can overcome the natural difficulties that attend a wound of the heart, end quote. How, how could such a learned, educated person 50 years prior, uh, roughly 50 years prior, prior to Leroy Rohrbach, say something so consequently stupid? Well, I don't think it was. I think it's a bit unfair to characterize as, uh, as that as stupid. I mean, what was, what's going on here is the cusp of a paradigm change. Um, okay. Because he, he, he was thinking of something that would involve an incremental change to the techniques he had at his disposal in 1896 with Stephen Paget. And actually what was necessary was not incremental change, it was a whole new way of thinking about surgery. So if you think about where the heart is in the body, there are two very obvious problems to operating on it. One is that it's imprisoned in this kind of cage of bone, in the rib cage. Um, and if you open that rib cage, then you also um, you end up compromising the patient's breathing because the lungs collapse. It's impossible for the patient to breathe and they suffocate within a, a matter of minutes. And the other thing is that if you're interfering with the heart, it's not possible for the circulation to continue. So that's two problems which to him would have been utterly insoluble. But actually, if you think about it in a completely different way and you say, well, uh, we're going to find a way of keeping the patient breathing while we're opening the chest. And you also say, well, we're going to find a way of continuing the circulation, even though the heart isn't beating anymore. Well, then that does open the way to possibly operating on the heart. Um, and it's just that Paget, who was then ending uh, towards the end of his career in 1896, um, and it was going to take the next generation of surgeons to find the solutions to those problems that would make it possible to operate on the heart consistently and regularly. You point out that the heart was fairly taboo, um, but other parts of the body had been had a lot more work done on them in the 19th century. Um, can you explain to us why the heart was so taboo? You mentioned, you know, obviously you had to get to it first, um, but beyond that. Yes, I mean, for the reasons I just mentioned, that, that, that there are two aspects, this, really. There's the surgical taboo element, and then there's the kind of cultural taboo. Surgically, there were those problems. In fact, a whole new um, incision was invented by a surgeon, in uh, a British surgeon working in Egypt um, in, in about 1910, uh, worked out a, a way of, of cutting open the chest to sort of separate the breastbone and pull the ribs apart, which is now um, known as a sternotomy, a median sternotomy. It's the, the way that cardiac surgeons most often get to the, the heart these days. 
Uh, there were importantly breakthroughs in anesthesia, uh, positive pressure anesthesia that allows you to put a tube inside the patient's trachea and, and breathe for them artificially. But there was also this, this idea that the heart was kind of off limits culturally as well. Um, in that it's this it's the organ that kind of keeps moving day and night um, and it just seems that um, if you interfere with the operation of that you're interfering with the life of the patient as well um, there was actually for quite a long time until the eight, until the early 1890s when a series of um, experiments by German physiologists proved otherwise there was a thought that even if you even touched the heart it was it was probably you were going to stop it beating and it was only when um, experimenters had had uh, conducted experiments on stitching the hearts in animals, dogs um, and rabbits, that they realised that actually it was quite, um, um, it, it was an organ that, that was that was quite robust, that it didn't match if you handled it, even you could insert a stitch in it um, without it um, giving up the ghost as it were. So it was only when those experiments kind of fed into um, changing how we see the heart culturally um, that surgeons lost some of their concerns about operating on it. To follow on that idea of the heart being more dynamic and being able to take trauma, um, we did have evidence from history, as you point out, and I, I think this is, your, your book is obviously, a, you know, in some respects, it's a medical book. Um, in other respects, it's a historical book. Uh, you just have great uh, backstories. Um, and the one I, one of the I pulled was, you talked about Galen in the first century AD, um, who was uh, doing, you know, he, he was dealing with the gladiators coming back uh, from Pergamon, um, can, can you teach us about what Galen learned about the attributes of the heart then? Yes, well, Galen was, um, uh, Galen noticed that um, the two sides of the heart were different. Now, today we think of these as the, the we know that the heart is a, 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 an organ of four chambers. It has two atria and two uh, ventricles. And the left side and the right side perform different functions. And one of the things that Galen noticed in his treatment of the gladiators was that a gladiator who was stabbed in the right side of the heart um, died more slowly or, and in some rare cases even could survive but when they were stabbed in the left side of the heart and that's the side of the heart that deals with blood at higher pressure that's pumping blood to the whole of the body rather than just the lungs as the right side of the heart does he noticed that, that they tended to die quickly or even instantaneously so he had some idea that the two sides of the heart were different from each other he also had uh, many misconceptions about the role of the heart he had no conception of course that there was a blood circulation he thought that it was sort of pumped inwards and out it, that blood uh, came in and out like sort of water um, in, uh, like, the, like the sea, waves of the sea. Um, he also believed that there were pores um, which allowed blood to pass from one side of the heart to the other. We now know that that's not the case. That wasn't disproved until, in fact, by a couple of Arabic thinkers of the, um, in, in the early medieval period. Um, so, but Galen did, in some ways, have insights into um, what the heart was uh, that were not replicated for centuries afterwards. So another technique that you bring up early in your book and comes, uh, uh, you know, in the early chapters particularly, um, you talk about bloodletting and how that was a common practice throughout, you know, pretty much the entire night, all the way up through the 19th century. Um, so I, I guess just because I'm a millennial, Thomas, and like this sounds crazy to most people to learn this, can you explain bloodletting just for what it is? And then and we'll talk more about the practice and the idea behind it. Put simply, bloodletting was the idea that there were certain types of ailments that could be treated, if not cured, by deliberately taking blood from the body. And there are various techniques for doing this. That One of the most common was venesection, which just involved making a, a nick in a vein in the, in the arm or elsewhere in the body and taking a, 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 some preordained amount of blood out of the body. There were less traumatic ways of doing it that... that for instance scarification was one where you take much smaller amounts um, and the origin of this idea is right back in ancient medicine and it comes back to get the Galen, Galen's doctrine of the four humours which was really a governing doctrine of medicine for close to two millennia and uh, it was still in force in the 18th century and in the 19th century as enlightenment science started to banish some of these very old ideas um, bleeding was one of the techniques, the medical techniques, which persisted for longer than others. And in fact, as late as the 
turn of the 20th century, so into the 1890s, you can still find uh, physicians writing in medical journals that they advocate bleeding. It started to fall out of favour quite a lot earlier than that, several decades before. Um, certainly by the 1830s and the 1840s, you find lots of articles written by um, physicians saying that this is an old-fashioned practice without any sort of scientific basis and it should be abandoned. The, the reason for bleeding originally was that um, a, a, an illness was thought to be uh, the result of a build-up of too much blood and that you could restore the balance by reducing the amount of blood circulating through the body uh, to its natural level. Um, but yes, it was, a, it was an amazingly persistent idea and there were a few physicians who believed in its efficacy um, even after science had really shown that there was no truth behind it. Yeah, you pointed out that even when people knew the notion of uh, it was not effective, they just continued to use it almost in an inertial force if you will, and that becomes kind of a common theme um, where prior practices are held um, just because uh, you know taking a risk uh, might be more damaging your, to your career than trying to prove something right. So um, let's jump forward. You, you talk about, uh, early in the book too, about how radiography um, was so important to understanding what, what we know about the heart today. Yes, um, the invention of x-rays in, in the late 19th century Correct. Um, is there one aspect of that in particular you were thinking of? Well, I, I, I just, I, I think, I think to understand, um, you know, what it taught us about the heart. For example, you know, what X-rays actually do. They hit the bone, um, and then what that teaches us about the heart. I think is a starting point. X-rays are mainly a method of, of looking at um, hard tissues. Uh, 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 visualized particularly clearly so bones are the first structures that were visualized on x-rays in fact the one of the earliest surviving x-rays um wilhelm Röntgen, who who first discovered x-rays took an x-ray of his wife's hand which shows her, her, the bones of her hand and the ring on her finger um, very clearly but it wasn't until the 1920s um, when uh, a man called Werner Forsman, who's a, a young German doctor, inserted a um, catheter into his own heart, having inserted it into uh, the inside of his own elbow, and then went downstairs, four flights of stairs, to get himself x-rayed to show that he'd actually succeeded in getting this catheter all the way up through a vein in his arm and into the cardiac chambers. And it actually took some time for anybody to appreciate that what he had done was a useful thing. Um, he thought it would be a method perhaps one day for uh, injecting drugs into the heart. But actually the first practical use it has, it had, was for visualising the vessel, the heart itself and the vessels around it. And nobody actually appreciated the value of what he'd done for, for almost a decade. And then in the 1940s, um, particularly in, the, in France and then in the United States, um, physicians realized that by using this technique, uh, uh, injecting contrast medium through the catheter, uh, which had been inserted into the heart, it was possible to get these beautiful pictures of the blood vessels around the heart. And it took, uh, I mean, half a dozen great innovators and probably three decades. Um, but this was eventually evolved into the technique which is used to visualize the coronary arteries and therefore to diagnose coronary artery disease. Uh, and there was a very important radiographer called Mason Soans, a cardiologist called Mason, Mason Soans, who developed this technique. And coming out of that came the entire surgical technique of, co of coronary artery um, grafting, uh, the bypass surgery, um, which was pioneered by René Favaloro in the late 1960s at the Cleveland Clinic. So that's an interesting example, I think, of one technology, the invention of x-rays, translating over the course of several decades, so close to a century actually, um, from a very simple technique for visualizing blood vessels into eventually a very sophisticated surgical technique. You teach your readers about uh, what Alfred Blaylock uh, sought to do uh, to heal blue babies. Um, t could you teach our listeners about cyanosis and, and what Blaylock was trying to accomplish? Yes, this was in a sense the, the very first um, useful heart surgery for congenital conditions. The problem that they were looking at um, was that Alfred Blaylock uh, was trying to solve was a congenital condition called um, Tetralogy of Fallow. And um, Tetralogy of Fallow is a congenital condition in which the, the heart has um, four separate uh, deformities. And Cyanosis is, is one of the symptoms. Cyanosis is um, a blue tinge to the, the, to the, to the body. Um, it, it, it literally means a blueness. 
Uh, and the reason for the blueness of the skin and um, other tissues in this condition is that the blood is not being properly, properly oxygenated. And they were known as blue babies, the children who suffered from this, um, because it was very obvious very often to uh, anybody who examined one of these children that they had something serious going on with the oxygenation of the blood. And he and two of his colleagues, um, who were um, both at the same hospital as him in Baltimore, um, came up with an operation um, which became known as the, as the blue baby operation, uh, not to cure it, but to alleviate the symptoms. Um, so uh, his collaborators there were Vivian Thomas, who was an, until quite recently not credited as having been part of this. He was a, an African-American technician who worked in the lab. It was really only economic circumstances that meant that he was not able, firstly, to study, uh, to qualify as a doctor in his own right, um, and, and secondly, to take any credit for this amazing developmental work he'd done in the laboratory. And uh, the third person um, was um, an amazing woman um, called Tausig, um, who was a cardiologist, the, the leading cardiologist um, for children uh, in, the, in the United States. Um, and between them, they came up with the idea of this operation and then instituted it. And within a few years of the first operation, which took place in 1944, hundreds of patients had flocked to Baltimore, to Johns Hopkins, uh, to receive it. Um, it was an absolute sensation, and it really is the beginning of um, cardiac surgery for con uh, congenital cardiac surgery, which has become an enormous field now. I, I found this story really interesting because, to your point, the two colleagues assisting Blaylock were utter outsiders. I, I think you point out that Tossig um, is blind, uh, and so she had taught herself uh, ways around her blindness, and as you pointed out, um, their other colleague was an African American, uh, untrained, you know, relative to the medical field. Uh, I must uh, just correct that. Helen Tausig was actually profoundly deaf. She'd had, oh, um, she'd had yeah, a child, yeah, That's she'd, correct. she'd had a childhood infection, which had, which had left her quite deaf. Um, yeah, so she had, she had worked out a method of um, because she had a. Um, she had a stethoscope, which was apparently amplified, an early amplified mm -hmm. stethoscope, but she had actually taught herself to diagnose different types of heart murmur using her hands. Yeah, to have these people with such outside uh, conditions. You know, when I say conditions, in other words, one is the oppression of a person learning, and the other is the inability uh, to hear, and yet they overcame what were incredible um, odds against themselves personally. And I thought was just, you know, to see um, Blaylock taking these risks. And then you point out in the story that like William Long Longmire, who is a protege and a colleague of his, thought they were doing something incredibly dangerous for these babies. Yes. And it was a controversial operation. There's no doubt about it. The original anesthesiologist who was meant to be taking part in the first blue baby operation declined to take part. He thought it was it was inevitable that the child would be killed by the operation. Um, it was um, it was incredibly dangerous, um, and it was also it, uh, it, there's no way that, for instance, this would get past an ethics committee today. Um, mm -hmm. The uh, Blaylock, who took the lead in the operation, had never performed it before. He had practiced it once in the animal laboratory. Uh, Vivian right. Thomas, who had invented the operation and, and derived all the techniques. Um, he had done all the preliminary work. He had performed the operation many times. He actually stood in the operating theatre, although he wasn't qualified uh, as a doctor or a surgeon. He stood in the sure. operating operating room behind Alfred Blaylock, supervising and giving him advice. Um, and and he Helen Tausig stood at, at the head of the, uh, at the at the table as it all went on. But one of the things I, th I think comes to the fore in this story of cardiac surgery again and again is that if you if you're not going to be the first person to try something who is and um the 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 way that risk is perceived um in medicine has changed and has had to change um mm -hmm. and a lot of these barriers have been broken now and do not have to be broken down ever again thank goodness but at the time there was seen to be sort of no alternative to being the first person to being the risk taker uh, and the one who was just going to give something a go even if it had a fatal outcome what I think there's an interesting um, kind of, I'll call it an ethical trade-off that this story brings up, and it obviously recurs later in your book, um, which is that these babies were dying young. I mean, they were living miserable quality of life, very short. And so to your point, the risk became a question of, do we try to take a risk that elongates life and creates more quality of life, but risks immediate death? And that becomes, I think, what is a common theme across 
the rest of the chapters of your book. Yes, so, and and the reason that I the, the reason the reason I would say that um, a lot has changed and it was justifiable then and it isn't justifiable now is that so much in medicine is better and sure. uh, in 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 that era there really was no alternative you're faced with a patient who will die uh, unless something is done and they will probably die if an operation is attempted but is is probably dying better than definitely dying well there are circumstances in which it can be now of course that dilemma doesn't really arise these days it, it, sure. at all if ever it, you know it, 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 it arises rarely, if ever. So thank goodness that's not the sort of dilemma that a surgeon has to face now because there is there is almost always something that will prolong or improve life um, that, that is, you know, that, that, that there is, it's not the case that there is only, the only alternative is something very risky. To follow on this ethical question, I, I, I love thinking about this in today of the day we live and to your point, it's so much has changed. Um, animals, as you pointed out uh, uh, just shortly ago, were the you know the learning ground for many of these procedures. Um, I'm going to quote from your book here. By the mid-1930s, surgeons in America and Europe were conducting hundreds of animal experiments in order to establish the likely difficulties of surgery on the heart and its major vessels, end quote. To the millennial or Gen Z person out there that reads about you know people using animals as the proving and testing ground for this um, and animal experiments... Um, it's obviously not a perfect world, but the gain from human life has been far greater, some would argue. How do you look at even that debate of using animals relative to what we just talked about, where we're using live humans to learn about the quality of life and, and, and you know, in, elongating life? Well, I think the only way I can look at it really is as a troubling history. Sure. Um, I mean, I, I'm grateful that it's not the sort of choice we have to make today. Um, there is certainly no way that we would contemplate uh, the number of, uh, or num not just the number, but also the nature of the experiments that went on. Um, I mean, I, it's difficult to read sometimes the accounts of um, the number of cats, for instance, that were used as experimental subjects during the development of the heart-lung machine, a process which lasted almost 18 years. And they were regarded as just a sort of dispensable part of laboratory equipment in a way. I, I think they were I mean, I was about to say they were treated humanely. I, I don't think you could really defend the way they were they were treated. Um, but um, it's it's part of surgical history that we just have to accept as having happened, sure. um, and be grateful that we don't have to do such a thing again. Agree. So, so um, I found this like a really interesting tidbit. Um, teach us, te teach our listeners what the death of a prostitute in 18th century Italy. Uh, taught us about the heart from the writing of Giovanni Morgnani. Yes, uh, so Morgnani was a, a great. Um, I mean, we would today we would call him a pathologist. He was really an anatomist, um, but he wrote this very um, substantial work of the, his pathological findings. And what he did was he would <laughs> essentially seem to hunt out any unusual um, uh, death um, and he dissected bodies as soon as possible after death to find out uh, what appearances he would find. Appearance is a word that crops up a lot in anatomy in this era. Um, to find out what was going on inside the body of this person who had died. But he went one stage further than that because he tried to find some correlation between the symptoms in life and what he found inside the body after death. Um, and there is this particular case study. I mean, the, the whole work is absolutely fascinating. It's one of those books you kind of dip into and you find yourself getting through four or five chapters before you know it. Um, but this particular case um, is of a, a young woman who was a prostitute and she died of what turned out to be an aortic aneurysm. And he finds um, when he dissects the body um, that uh, he has this absolutely perfect description of what an aortic aneurysm looks like um, and was able again to correlate the the appearances after death with the symptoms in life um, which which is one of the reasons that later doctors knew um, how to recognize uh, an aortic aneurysm from the symptoms presented by the mm. patient so to jump to the next uh, procedure and and topic uh, for the heart that I found really interesting is on the aneurysm. Um, can you explain the popliteal aneurysm and how it was commonly dealt with prior to John Hunter's work? So yes, the popliteal aneurysm. The, uh, this is um, relating to a blood vessel which is kind of in your thigh, in the upper leg, 
Um, and um, it was actually an it's an interesting case of a um, an occupational injury, in that it was often suffered by um, cab cabmen, people who were uh, spending a lot of time sitting at the front of um, uh, carts and so on. So professional drivers of um, of horse drawn carriages, um, and the. I mean, I think this is one of those ones which, if memory serves, that, that was often treated by bleeding. Mm -hmm. And yeah, John Hunter was... The... You, yeah, you mentioned John Hunter started with bloodletting first. That's where he began. Yes. Um, and, in fact, he ended up treating it with um, the first recorded operation um, in which he, uh, the, the technical term is ligated, but basically tied a knot around um, the abdominal aorta, um, which is a sort of horrifying procedure in retrospect this is the era before anesthetics we're talking about the late 18th early 19th century and he ended up tying a length of cotton tape around the abdominal aorta which runs in parallel with the spine on a patient who was not um not anesthetized um so he had to make an incision in the front of the abdomen and then get his hands right to the back of the abdomen to tie this this cotton tape around it and an interesting kind of side note to this is that uh, the patient made a sort of recovery at first, but sadly died shortly afterwards. And the section of the aorta with the cotton tape still tied around it is still in a museum in London, mm -hmm. uh, an, an anatomical museum. Uh, the first case of a surgeon ever um, operating on the aorta of a, of a patient. Harris Schumacher improvised while dealing with an aneurysm in 1947, as you wrote in your work. Um, what did he do in comparison? And wasn't this... Um, the practicality that the field needed. Uh, yes. Um, well, he he was um, uh, he was <laughs> uh, he was dealing with um, a, 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 a different part of the aorta, which is uh, in the thoracic aorta, which is right up, kind of under the uh, under the rib cage. Um, and in, in fact, I think he was. I think Harry Schumacher was dealing with um, a, a condition called the coarctation, which is actually congenital, which is a narrowing of the of the aorta, which means that you end up with a much reduced blood flow um, to much of the body. Um, and he found, in fact, that um, he, when he came to cut out this coarctation, which is a, an operation which had been um, derived a few years earlier, that there was also an aneurysm attached. And that by simply snipping out the affected section, the narrowed section of the aorta and sewing the ends together, he had unwittingly or, or you know, almost as a side effect, he had removed the aneurysm. Um, so, I mean, yes, the, there is a lot of improvisation in the history of surgery and a lot of firsts where the surgeon perhaps wasn't aware what a breakthrough they were making until after it had been made. So being, being from the state of Washington myself, I'm born and raised in Seattle. So when I'm, you know, when I'm digging into your book, and I got to chapter five where you start to talk about valves. Um, you tell a story of about a, a man in 1970 who dies falling on a ladder, which seems not very novel. And yet at the same time, the fact that he was dying in 1970 was incredibly novel for what we saw with the progress of heart surgery at that time. Yeah, well, I mean, the, the reason it's a remarkable death uh, is, as you say, it's not because he fell off a ladder or because of his age 62, because there must be lots of 62 year olds who, who, who die falling off ladders. Um, but it was the fact that he, he, in some sense, he had sort of no right to expect to be alive at the age of 62. Um, so he died in June 1970. His name was Philip Admanson. And 10 years earlier, um, he had been the first person um, to receive a, a new type of heart valve. In fact, he was the first survivor uh, of an operation uh, to replace the mitral valve. Um, and he had been operated on uh, by a great surgeon called Albert Starr, who, in collaboration uh, with a retired engineer um, called um, uh, Lowell Edwards, um, had come up with um, a very simple ball and cage design um, to replace the physiological valve that we're all born with. And in... in uh, September 1960, Starr had inserted this newly invented valve into Philip Amundsen. Um, he'd had mitral valve disease. He was extremely sick, and the chances were that he was going to die within weeks, if not, you know, uh, sh sooner than that. Um, and this valve, which was a thing made from stainless steel and a plastic ball, 
um, kept him alive successfully for another 10 years. And to have been fit enough to climb a ladder in his 60s after having nearly died 10 years earlier gives you some idea of what an amazingly successful invention this was. And I should say also, by the way, there are still survivors to this day of operations to replace their valve with a Star Phillips valve um, from the 1960s. So there are plenty of people on record who have lived for 50, 60 years with one of these things inside their heart. Shows how important it was in terms of bringing us forward. So let, let's jump. Um, James Herrick, uh, and if my notes are to serve me correctly, this was tied to thrombosis and, and angina. Um, you know, when he published his work in 1912, you said in your book that his findings fell flat as a pancake. Um, you point out that it took 10 years for others uh, to adopt his views on this malady. Um, why, why was his work novel? And yet at the same time, are we just running into the profession not willing to take risks and, and use it to create change? Well, I should just explain, first of all, so what, what Herrick had found, he thought to his satisfaction, was an association between angina, chest pain caused by coronary artery disease, and um, uh, thrombosis in the coronary vessels and heart attack. Um, and he thought there was a clear association, and his colleagues basically disagreed. Um, and he also suggested further than that, that... Um, it was possible for angina to be caused not by deposits in the larger coronary arteries, but in the sort of branch of tiny, uh, the tiny branches of the coronary arteries deep, deep in the heart muscle. And uh, there are various reasons that he was not believed or that his work was not taken seriously at first. Um, one was um, simple um, inertia that a lot of physicians were kind of invested in uh, the medicine they'd grown up with and the scholarship that they knew. But having said that, um, coronary artery disease is one of the most sort of deceptive conditions there is. Uh, and even today you can see it, it, um, the, the, the methods of increasing, um, uh, of improving angina are completely mysterious a lot of the time. So um, angina sometimes gets better or gets worse just by the act of sitting in a doctor's waiting room. Um, and the problem that he had and that the other doctors of the, of the era um, ha had with it is that there's... Um, there's not a perfect correlation between finding fatty deposits in a coronary artery and suffering from angina. Um, so there are patients who have angina who have no sign of any deposit. And similarly, there are patients with lots of um, cholesterol uh, plaque in their, in, their, in their arteries who give not a symptom of, of, of angina, of coronary artery disease at all. Um, so, I mean, resistance of that type persisted in, in the field of um, coronary artery disease for decades after that 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 failure he had in in whatever it was 1912 and your book really i think i think as we get into you know studying this and the coronary issues that come up i think your book in this procedure um in this chapter really teaches about kind of you know what's the what's the elasticity of taking risks um because as you point out like i i, I and i'll pardon me if i mispronounce this but INSQ um, taught us how to deal with the symptoms where he effectively severed the artery or probably severed the nerve so that no one felt the pain, even though they had pain. Uh, yes, exactly. He invented uh, uh, the sympathectomy, which was um, a way of severing the nerves that were carrying the pain of angina to the brain. Uh, and so making the patient unaware of it. Um, and there's actually a deep sense in which um, any sort of, well, many sorts of cardiac intervention are not getting to the cause, they're getting to the symptoms. Mm -hmm. um, a bypass surgery is getting is really getting rid of the symptoms. It's not getting rid of the underlying cause, which is um, the blood chemistry, the um, the cholesterol, the lifestyle, all those sorts of things. And in fact, in many in cases, the um, the genetics. You know, there's a there's a whole class of people who suffer from coronary artery disease partly just because of the genes they've been born with, as well as the lifestyle factors that may go into it. Um, and one of the things I was really struck by is that there are very few procedures in the entire history of cardiac surgery which can be said to be curative. They are mainly alleviating symptoms or alleviating conditions rather than getting rid of them entirely. That can be said, for instance, of the whole class of congenital heart surgeries. You're never saying this heart is the way it should be made. You're always saying this heart has been corrected to some extent or made a bit better. Um, but it's not possible to say this heart, which, which I found diseased, I have turned into a pristine heart, a perfect heart. Um, there is no such thing. When you point out that, um, obviously, as this progressed, the studying of all these techniques progressed, 
Um, in that chapter, you talk about the double blind study that was done by the University of Washington. I'm I'm obviously stealing local affiliation again, um, but where but where you know they do this double blind study, um, and I think it was you know they were looking at Beck and, and Weinberg's work on using mammal arteries um, on the heart, and they obviously walked out of that study learning that the patients that had nothing done on them were just as good off. So you know back to this idea of risks, um, but yet the question is are the risks worth it? But then. Uh, f uh, and I'll, I'll try to say this correctly. Uh, fa Favaloro, Favaloro improved on all this. What, what, what solution did he end up providing um, to this? Well, he ended up. I mean, a, a lot of heart, heart surgery can can be seen as sort of glorified plumbing, and his was a beautiful engineering solution to the problem of coronary artery disease. And the fundamental difficulty of, of, uh, of coronary artery disease is a blockage. It's that the, the heart muscle is not receiving enough oxygen because it's not receiving enough blood and that's happening because there is a blockage caused by plaque or clot um, uh, but the plaque is a buildup of cholesterol, fatty cholesterol and um, Favaloro's solution to that was well let's bypass the blockage let's find a way of getting the blood to the the the, the, um, the further point um, of, of the vessel um, and just bypassing the blockage so he took a length of the saphenous vein, which is a vein in the leg, and he sewed one end of this to the aorta, the main blood vessel coming out of the heart, and the other end to a point in the coronary artery just beyond the blockage. And that meant that the tissue beyond the blockage was still perfused or would be perfused once more by oxygenated blood. The heart muscle would remain healthy um, and the patient's activity levels would be able to increase. Um, without any uh, adverse effects and it's a massively massively successful um, surgery it was a massively successful procedure he introduced it in 1967 and one of the things that marks him out from a lot of um, other innovators was that he was fantastically aware of the importance of statistics of presenting his argument quantitatively as well as qualitatively and he was absolutely fastidious in putting together his results um, in analysing them statistically. And then when he presented his results, there was a famous occasion when he came to a, um, a cardiology conference in London uh, in about 1970, and he presented his results. And the surgeons were absolutely in disbelief at what he claimed. And he was able to back up his claims because he had by then a case series of some three or 400 patients. And he was able to show that the results were every bit as good as he had claimed in the headline to this presentation. Um, so uh, that's one of the reasons I think he's such an important surgeon, not merely because of the technique that he derived and improved, uh, but also because he was able to make his argument so powerfully through numbers. And as you point out, uh, bypasses became very prevalent because they were effective for at least stopping the blockage. And I think you mentioned that the most famous uh, quadruple bypass, uh, you know, up, up to a certain point was uh, the former president, Bill Clinton, in 04. Um, but you also present kind of an ethical question being asked by society, which is that these are so profitable. Um, you know, the surgeons are ending up with the sports cars and second homes, and we're kind of back at an ethical barrier to a certain extent uh, from your writing. Yes, I mean that's kind of dependent also on 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 health system. I, I think the the whole argument about whether this is about surgeons enriching themselves was, was one that's I think local to America, um, because um, it was at, th at that day particularly a health system that kind of encouraged that sort of behaviour. Um, now, in a kind of more socialized health system, that wasn't the case so much. Um, and it was possible eventually. There was a whole series of scientific peer reviewed papers uh, in the 70s and 80s that were trying to find out whether um, the bypass operation really was as good as it sounded uh, and as good as Favaloro had claimed. And actually, by then, there was a huge amount of data, not just from America, but from all over Europe as well and, and from the Far East. Um, which showed without any doubt that it was superior to doing nothing and superior to drugs. So that whole aspect of the argument went out of the window. But yes, there was certainly there was certainly a phase when, um, particularly surgeons who were outside the kind of main centres of surgical excellence, um, and 
I think the way uh, healthcare has been organised in the last 40 years has changed a lot as well. But you would find surgeons who were in smaller centres where they had rather small cardiac surgery experience were setting themselves up as um, coronary artery bypass specialists and doing a lot of operations, often with not very high standards and actually getting quite rich as a result of it. So there was definitely a bit of a scandal going on in, in the medical world at that time. It was exposed by certain um, investigative journalists. Um, but, um, you know, in, in scientific terms, the truth will out eventually. Um, and, and we now know that it is an excellent operation with excellent outcomes. In your chapter, One Life, Two Hearts, you introduce us all to the what I would kind of deem as the modern day rock star of heart procedures, um, Christian uh, Bernard. Um, can you can you uh, teach our listeners about who he was, why he was so novel, and why he became an icon of the era? Well, he was um, certainly a leading cardiac surgeon of the 1960s. Um, when he became the first person to perform a heart transplant in 1967, uh, there was general disbelief in the surgical world because he was not regarded as a transplant specialist. He had no particular track record. Uh, certainly in transplant um, experiments, but also he had done very little transplant surgery of any type. He had, I think, performed kidney transplants on one patient before he attempted his fir first heart transplant. He was a very brilliant heart surgeon who had studied with some of the best um, and greatest surgeons in America. Um, he had taken back with him when he had finished studying in the States the first heart-lung machine in Africa, the whole of the African continent, which was presented to him by one of his professors as a gift. Um, and as well as being a brilliant heart surgeon, he was also, I think, a fiercely ambitious person who really wanted to be the first person on the planet to perform the, the first heart transplant. Um, but it came from left field. There was a great surgeon in, in the States called Norman Shumsky, who, who was regarded by many as inevitably the first person to transplant a heart. It was a great surprise that he was not the first person to do it. But Barnard was sort of the spirit of the age in as much as he was a very good looking guy in his 40s. Um, he loved fast cars and boats and uh, beautiful women. Um, and he was sort of photographed in the glossy, glossy magazines having affairs with film stars and hanging out in nightclubs. Um, and he was, for several years, I would say, pretty much the most famous person on the planet. He was sort of Elvis levels of famous. Mm -hmm. And I think it's interesting that this event, the first transplant, came around, came about two years before the, land, the, the first moon landings. I think this is like, in some ways, the peak 1960s event. This, this is the spirit of the age. This is the sign that we are ent entering a new sign of uh, a new age of modernity. Um, but he was, <laughs> he was the face, if you like, of the new heart surgery era. So then you point out that fewer than half of the 65 heart transplant patients um, were even alive 12 months later. Um, you know, Favaloro, he was using a lot of data to prove his point, but because of the brevity of this, we knew that there wasn't success in terms of duration and we couldn't have a, a large amount of numbers. D did this just scream for more time and, and, and a lot more thinking? Yeah, it was very obvious that there was something very seriously wrong with the operation. Uh, within a, a matter of two or three years, in the early 1970s, Time magazine uh, published a long investigative piece about the transplant, uh, the heart transplant era. Uh, patients just weren't living for long enough. Uh, a few would get to say a hundred days. Um, there were one or two who lived beyond a year. One of uh, Barnard's early patients did live for more than a year, but all too few did. And the main problem was rejection. It was simply that the donor hearts would be rejected by the recipient's body because their immune systems recognized the tissue of the donated heart as alien. And then it started attacking, the immune system would start to attack the organ and they would go into um, eventually um, acute rejection and then they would die of heart failure. And there were two things that went to um, improving the situation. Um, by the early 1970s, 1971, 72, almost all the surgeons who had started doing transplantation gave up on it because they realised yeah. the outcomes weren't good enough. Mm -hmm. And the two things that changed were firstly a technique change um, and there were one or two uh, very brave um, souls, one of them, uh, a surgeon called Richard Lower, 
um, who worked out ways of improving matches between donor organs and recipients. Mm -hmm. uh, but then the really big change uh, turned up in the late 1970s, and that was the advent of a new drug, cyclosporin, which mm -hmm. prevented rejection by suppressing the immune systems of the recipients. Um, which came and from it's really only pharmaceutical, I believe. It, you point out in your book that was a Sandoz product, correct? It was. It was, and it was discovered in the soil of uh, of, of a Nor Norwegian wood. Um, it's interesting how many of these drugs kind of turn up in unexpected places. There's also a drug that's used um, on stents, uh, which was found in the sand in the soil of Easter Island. Um, so drug discovery can come in very unexpected places. Uh, but cyclosporin was a real game changer. It was pioneered in this country by um, a surgeon called Roy Kahn, um, who used it in uh, kidney and, kidney and um, liver transplants. And then in, by the early 1980s, a lot of cardiac surgeons were using it. And it is what has made possible um, the survivals, sometimes for more than 30 years, of heart transplant patients. Yeah, because that part of your book, I think, really opened up, because we're talking about a lot of procedures, a lot of surgery, and then that the, the Sandoz find creates this whole kind of new avenue into thinking about how um, pharmaceuticals can obviously um, work in, on alleviating some of these issues, which is obviously, like you pointed out, that's how medicine's changed in a lot of ways um, as we talk about cardiology today. Um, let's see, Thomas, I know we didn't get to the artificial heart and the heart-lung machine, which I'm going to leave that for listeners to your book because I think it's such a, it's a fun story. And I mean, the ethical questions and the public outcry and all those type of topics. But um, before before we uh, you know break this episode, I, I just want to ask the question, is there anything that we didn't touch on in your book that, that you think um, we should have mentioned in our, in our discussion today? Well, I think you were just touching on it as we got to the end there, uh, really, which is when you were saying the role of pharmaceuticals is important. Actually, the other thing that's important in this subject is to see this as a ra in the round. So a surgeon is never working in isolation. Uh, many, many times in, in this book, we're talking also about engineering solutions, about the heart valve, the heart lung machine, the artificial heart. These are devices which are developed by engineers. But also, um, these surgeons are building on basic science discoveries by physiologists, by chemists, by biochemists. That there's a whole sort of, if you like, backroom staff of people who are feeding into surgical discovery, uh, whose contribution is just as important as, as that of the surgeon themselves. Well, this has been just a, a lot of fun to visit with you, Thomas. And I, I, like I said earlier, I love your work. Um, the Matter of the Heart teaches how tough it can be uh, to be an entrepreneurial person uh, when it is your profession and lives are on the line, as we've talked about. Um, I'd say this is a great read for historians, doctors, investors, business people under very um, tight pressure situations. Um, uh, I really thank you for your time today, Thomas. And um, in, in your writing, I'd love to have you back because I think your storytelling is wonderful. There's all these people that I think about, um, you know, walking away from your, from your book. And so I really appreciate you joining. Thanks very much for having me. For our listeners, if you have a great book that you'd like to recommend, email podcast at smeadcap.com. That's podcast at smeadcap.com. Thank you for joining us for a Book With Legs podcast. We look forward to the next episode. Thank you for listening to A Book With Legs, a podcast brought to you by Smead Capital Management. The material provided in this podcast is for informational use only and should not be construed as investment advice. You can learn more about Smead Capital Management and its products at smeadcap.com or by calling your financial advisor.